presentation? Okay. So yes, I work with Dr. Martin Enns at the University of Manitoba. Um, I started there about 17 years ago, but I did do a few other things in between. So it's not, it depends how you count how long I've been there. But at any rate, I have learned a lot from working with him, and I'm constantly learning more, which is the beauty of working in a university and also working with directly with farmers of all different types. And uh, I find I'm learning so much stuff from farmers all the time. It's really exciting. So uh, I want to talk today about soil fertility and nutrient, nutrient management on organic farms. And a lot of new organic farmers or people who are just considering it have a lot of questions about this. And so I think it's a really important topic to be thinking about. But even those experienced organic farmers in the crowd, um, and myself, all of us who are working in this all the time, we all need to be reminded of some stuff, some basics, uh, so that we can really get our heads around what is happening in the soil, what makes plants grow well, um, how do we build up soil quality, soil health, all those things. And those are really important for all of us to keep learning about. Uh, I forget what all the little quotes are that people have about, um, you know, the, how much we know about space compared to know how much we know about the soil. And basically, we, we know more about outer space than we know about what's happening in the soil. So there's still lots to learn, but there is a lot of information that uh, is out there already that we can learn from. So. Janine talked this morning about the standards for organic agriculture. And though that is a great document, not only for all the um, bits of information about what you can or can't do, but also the goals and the objectives and the principles of organic farming that are in there. So this is what the organic standard has to say about soil fertility. The main objective of the soil fertility and crop nutrient management program shall be to establish and maintain a fertile soil using practices, one, that maintain or increase soil humus levels, uh, humus being like soil organic matter, uh, two, that promote an optimum balance and supply of nutrients, and three, that stimulate biological activity within the soil. So we're going to talk about all these things a little bit today. I'm going to focus more on specifically on the first two. With the third one, the biological activity, it pokes its head up all over the place. So uh, we'll hear a bit about all these things. And we're going to start by talking a bit about soil organic matter. So what is exactly soil organic matter? Basically, it's all the stuff in the soil that either is alive or once was alive. Um, it might be just recently died, uh, it might be um, died and partially decomposed, it might be died and decomposed ages ago. There's all sorts of stuff in there and it includes stuff like plant roots uh, in various stages of life and death and decomposition, animal remnants, all that stuff, all different kinds of critters that live in the soil from the ones you can see like earthworms and beetles and whatnot to all the billions of things that you can't see. There's lots of fungi and bacteria and protozoa and all these little things living in that soil. Um, and then of course, there's all, when they die, their remains stay around in the soil for some time. They're gradually decomposed. Um, some of them stick around for a really long time. Um, and basically, uh, the soil organic matter is what gives the soil that nice dark color that you see, uh, especially in our prairie soils, that black or dark brown color. Um, when you get to uh, even say the brown soil zone of Saskatchewan and Alberta, there's, the reason it's brown and not black is that there's less soil organic matter that's been built up over the thousands of years of, of growing prairies there. And when you go to say tropical countries and you get those really red soils or kind of sandy, almost gray soils, uh, grayish tan, I guess, is because the soil organic matter is low. So a good sign of soil organic matter is a nice black soil. Um, soil organic matter does a lot of different things in soil. For one, it's a big reserve of nutrients, um, but it also um, influences a lot of the soil physical properties. So its structure, whether it, you know, kind of breaks up in big clods or whether it has that nice granular structure, affects how much water the soil can hold, 
um, all kinds of different things. I can talk about tilth. Uh, there's lots of things that soil organic matter does, and it basically comes into play. Um, it affects the biology of the soil. Um, it interacts with, I guess the biology also affects that. It goes both ways. Also the physical properties, like we talked about, structure, water holding capacity, all those things. Uh, and also what we can call the chemical properties, not chemicals as in synthetic products, but chemicals as in the science of chemistry, as in um, you know how molecules are being transformed in the soil and moving around and all that kind of stuff. So it's super important to all the functions of the soil. Um, because soil organic matter is made out of so many different things, you can imagine how difficult it is to study and to figure out how do you measure this stuff if it's like three zillion different things and in all these different forms from you know just barely added yesterday to uh, been in there for who knows long. Um, but there are a few things that soil scientists have figured out. I think they'll all admit that there's lots more they don't know, but there are some things, some useful things to think about um, thinking about organic matter. Um, and one of the most useful ways that I've seen to think about how organic matter works is to divide it into these pools, or basically percentages of the total amount. And those pools are based on basically how active that organic matter is, or how long it sticks around in the soil, or is being broken down or built up again. So on this little chart, you can see we've got three different pools. There's that little blue sliver and that's called the active organic matter. And that's the stuff that is either alive or has maybe just been recently added or um, is being, you know, in the, is kind of in the process of decomposition and it's kind of moving around doing lots of stuff. Um, <coughs> that portion of the organic matter makes up maybe about 5% of the total of what you've got. Uh, but it's also the portion that's responsible for a lot of the nutrient cycling processes. And um, what else? Uh, soil tilth, kind of that, uh, that structure that you see and that kind of granular um, feel, I guess, to the soil. And that or active organic matter can be around the soil anywhere from uh, days up to a few years. So for example, if you, if, um, you work a plant into that soil, uh, some of it will be recycled and gone, or decomposed and gone within a few days. Some of it might stick around three years or more, a few years. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got that big green chunk, and that's called the stable organic matter. And that's the stuff that can be around in soil anywhere from decades to centuries, even thousands of years. So think about that. Some of that black stuff in your soil was there before Christopher Columbus uh, walked this continent. Maybe, you know, maybe back, you know, predating um, biblical times. It's been, some of that is very, very old material and it's stuck in that soil in, it's basically protected in that soil and um, protected from further decomposition. And we'll talk a bit about that in a second. Um, it's responsible for stuff like the cation exchange capacity, which is kind of a fancy term for how many nutrients the soil can actually hold. Um, these nutrients sort of stick to the organic matter or clay. Uh, it also is where carbon is stored long term when we're talking about soil um, carbon sequestration. That's the part of the organic matter that we're really thinking about there because that is really sequestered, as in it's stuck there, it's staying there. That doesn't mean that it's immune to being broken down. It can, uh, it can break down, it builds up, there's always this balance going on, stuff coming in, stuff going out, but on average that stable organic matter is staying there for a long time. And it's generally a little over half of what we have in the soil in total. Then there's that red chunk and that's what they call, I think for the lack of a better term, the slow pool. It's kind of somewhere in between active and stable. Um, it performs some of the same functions as active and some of the same functions as the stable. It sticks around maybe for uh, you know decades to, or years to decades, I guess, somewhere in that range. 
So all these pools are in flux, there's stuff moving back and forth between them. Uh, something can get decomposed out of that stable pool and just be gone. It's not like it has to go through the slow pool and back into the active or anything. Um, stuff moves around between these all the time. It's a really dynamic process that I don't really understand. But, um, and even those who do understand everything that has been discovered about this, they, like I said, they admit there's a lot more to know that um, we just have no idea about. Um, let's see. I would like to use a little analogy here, and uh, this will keep coming up a bit, um, kind of comparing, you know, the soil and the organic matter and nutrients and stuff, um, talking about them in kind of financial uh, analogies. So soil organic matter, I would call something like a diversified investment portfolio, where you have some stuff that is just sitting there, you know, growing slowly, others that's going up and down, got lots of different things going on, some you can draw on quickly, some that, um, you know, won't be affected by market fluctuations, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's kind of interesting to think about. Okay, so if this stuff is so good, um, how can we build it? Well, I think we first need to look at how it gets formed in the soil in the first place. So building stable soil organic matter, and I'm talking mostly about the stable stuff because the, the active stuff is actually relatively easy to throw in there. Um, but it's building that stable organic matter that really provides long-term benefits and that um, resilience, I guess, against the ups and downs of whatever's coming. So here's what people think. And this is sort of a recent, um, I don't know if discovery is the right word or uh, realization to how this process works. Um, it used to be that we thought if you basically just add lots of carbon and rich material to the soil, you'll build up organic matter. And that's sort of true. Um, but there's more to it than that. They're finding now that um, instead of that stable organic matter being made out of actual compounds from plants, it's actually made mostly out of the dead bodies of microbes that get stuck into soil aggregates and protected there, sort of like little micro mummies there, um, <laughs> protected inside a little soil aggregate and can't be de decomposed any further and they can stay there for a thousand years or whatever. It's, it's quite amazing. So they're finding, they, they've found this because they found in some studies where they're adding lots and lots of carbon, but it's not sticking around in the soil. So what's going on? So this is what they think. Like uh, it shows on here, you have a plant, um, it gets decomposed, that little picture in the middle, I don't actually know what organism that is, but apparently it's a picture of soil microbes. So a bunch of different things in there, they work on that plant material, they basically eat it, it becomes part of them, and when they die, their bodies or their little, the little bits of bodies and the stuff they excrete and secrete and all those things can get stuck into the soil aggregates and protected there. Okay, one thing to mention here is that in, it's particularly the roots of the plants that contribute to stable organic matter. Uh, in a study where they looked at hairy vetch, they actually followed the carbon in the top part, the above ground growth of hairy vetch, and the roots of hairy vetch as a, like as a plow down kind of crop, a cover crop. And only about 13% of the above ground carbon actually ended up in the stable organic matter. And I think it was 55 or something like that percent, it was a little over half of the root carbon ended up in the stable organic matter. And that's because the roots are already right there in the soil. They're, it's much easier to protect that soil organic matter, that um, those microbes, if they're already right in the midst of that soil, already uh, really, you know, intimately bound up with those, uh, with the soil aggregates. Okay, so if that's how the process works, what can farmers do to help? Oops, sorry, one more step in the process. So what do these soil organisms need to actually um, make this process work well and build soil organic matter, build the stable stuff? For one thing, they need the right supplies. Um, organic matter is not just carbon. It has fairly consistent ratios, and I have them written down somewhere, and I don't remember the numbers offhand, but it has really consistent ratios of carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and probably a few other things. 
So that means that if there's lots of carbon around, but hardly any nitrogen, those microbes can't, they can't grow basically, and so they can't eventually be turned into soil organic matter. Same goes for phosphorus or sulfur. If any one of those ingredients is missing, the process breaks down. And then, so that extra carbon might just get re released as carbon dioxide. So they need all the right supplies. That means adding plant residues back in, in sort of balanced amounts. And carbon to nitrogen is the one that they know most about. And the, from what I've read, it seems like um, plant residues that have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of somewhere between 35 to 1 and 20 to 1 is about the best. So um, that would typically be um, something like a peel mix uh, that's not super rich in nitrogen, it's got some carbon in it, as, uh, more carbon rich oats in it as well, would generally fall somewhere in that range. A pure legume might have a bit of a low, uh, yeah, lower, you know, whatever, I always get this mixed up, whatever. The carbon to nitrogen ratio might be a little out of the desired range. Um, yeah, lower. Something like uh, wheat stubble will be higher, too much carbon, not enough nitrogen. Um, but you can, there's a, there's a bit of a range there to work with where it actually works well. And the other piece of that is that uh, you can't just uh, feed these guys like once every five years or something and then let them be. You have to give frequent additions of uh, plant material or some kind of organic, you know, plant or animal material for the microbes to work on. Okay, another piece of the puddle, puzzle is that the, the microbes need some good working conditions. They, just like all of us, need oxygen, they need moisture, they need suitable temperatures to survive. Um, and so there are some things that farmers can do about that, and we'll talk that, about that in a second. Um, but if those conditions do not exist, basically biological activity in the soil kind of shuts down. The other part that they need is a safe place to put that finished product, those little mummified microbes. Uh, if they can build stuff all you want, if they're just getting torn apart afterwards, you're not actually building stable organic matter. So that's where soil aggregates are really important. They physically protect that um, microbial, what they call microbial necromass, like you've heard of biomass, right? That's the living weight things. The necromass is the dead part afterwards. So they, the soil aggregates actually physically protect the, the, the dead bits and whatever of microbes. Okay, so now what can farmers do about this? This is not like a, first you do this, then this, then this, then this. Um, they are, all things that will contribute. Um, if I would if you press me on it and you say, pick one, I say, no, you pick one. Because um, really you have to find one that fits with your farm. And then I would just challenge you to, after you've picked one and started doing it, then you add another one and another one and another one until you're doing all of them. Um, growing perennials though is really important. Again, it comes down to those roots. Uh, you've got that root system all year long, it's going deeper, it's putting <coughs> soil organic matter down deep where it can't be broken down as quickly. And so that's uh, really important. Growing many different types of crops, it's sort of a, a biological insurance kind of thing. Basically you're increasing your chances that the um, you will have that right combination of nutrients for the, the critters in the soil to work on. There's also evidence that having more diversity above ground um, promotes more diversity below ground, and they've um, proven that. Uh, so that's a, a really important part of it too. Like I said before, feeding the soil often. So adding crop residues. Uh, grazing is really good for this, and that fits into the next point, because every time you graze a plant, it uh, kind of sloughs off some roots. Those get added to the, um, you know, all that biological activity that's going on. Um, yep, yeah, livestock is a great way, uh, partly because it promotes the use of perennials, but also, like I mentioned, that grazing action. They're also processing some of those nutrients themselves in their digestive system and putting them back in different forms, uh, adding nutrients from, uh, not, sorry, recycling nutrients in different ways. Minimizing tillage. This is a big one. Uh, a lot of new organic farmers, especially if they've come from a no-till um, perspective, are kind of, they don't really want to till. And, and you're right about that because 
um, there is a lot of damage that happens to soil during tillage. Uh, so as much as you can minimize it, the better. Uh, what I would say is probably none None of the organic farmers in this room who are alive now will be able to successfully do a completely organic no-till system. Or if you do, I'll give you a prize. Uh, we hope you can. Yes, we hope you can. But in reality, um, a little bit of tillage now and again uh, is probably necessary. What you can think about then, though, is just be aware that when you're on that disc or that plow or whatever it is, that you are doing damage and then do some penance by doing one of the other things, doing more work. Okay? And the last thing on the list, keep the soil covered. This helps with providing those good conditions for the, the microbes by, you know, not letting the surface of the soil get too hot by being baked in the sun. Um, it modifies the temperatures near the surface, helps conserve moisture, lots of good things about keeping the soil covered, including reducing erosion, all lots of really good things. So that fits into the tillage bit. If you have to till, seed something right away if you can to get that soil covered again as soon as possible. Okay, so that sort of sums up some of the new thoughts, not, not some of them are new, but some of the thoughts that I have on um, building soil organic matter. And uh, I think it's really important that we, as any kind of farmer, are thinking about that as sort of the main resource that we're, that we're really managing. Um, it uh, has so many benefits to soil and to, to the crops that are growing on that. Now, I'm gonna pause there. Yeah, so the question was about the sulfur to nitrogen ratios, and Janine's saying that there's some research that shows it should be around 10 to 1, 10 nitrogen to 1 sulfur. And yeah, that is sort of the, the I guess, the ballpark. the ballpark to be in. And sulfur is one of those nutrients that we often don't worry about in prairie soils, um, except for maybe certain crops. Um, but uh, it is important to think about and to... Look, keep an eye out for deficiencies, and we'll talk about the, uh, some of the things that you can do to keep your eye out, monitor what's actually going on nutrient-wise in your soil. Yeah. The question is, does organic matter equal fertility? Uh, sort of. You know, you may have those squiggly equal signs where it sort of equals that. Uh, yeah, it has, it, it has a lot to do with fertility. Uh, it's not the be all and end all, though. There are other factors. Someone pointed out to me that peat moss is essentially totally organic matter, yet it's very poor in nutrients. So it's not just because it's an organic material that makes it uh, have the right amounts of plant nutrients. But it is in agricultural soils, it is a big piece of the picture. And we'll talk a bit more about that as we go on to nutrient management. Anything else on soil organic matter? There'll be more time at the end, I think, I hope. Yes. Okay. If I... Okay, so back to this uh, little bit from the principles, going on to the fertility. Um, we want practices that promote an optimum balance and supply of nutrients. Well, what does that mean? Uh, let's think for a little bit first about what plants are actually made of. I found this. This is from, like, 1924. Some guy actually analyzed corn plants, like roots, like, and he divided up all, into, all the different parts, and then analyzed all the different components, not just like the nitrogen and stuff that, like, that we usually test for, every single element uh, that's in a corn plant. So he's finding that a corn plant, depending on the part, is about 40 to 45% carbon, 40 to 45% oxygen. That's interesting, I hadn't thought about that before. 5 to 6% hydrogen, and then you start getting into the nutrients that we usually think about. Nitrogen, 1 to 2%, depending on the part. 1% potassium, 0.5% calcium, and it goes down from there. So that means that about 90-some percent of that plant is literally coming out of thin air. Okay? The plant is taking carbon dioxide out of the air, building that carbon and that oxygen into this plant material. It's taking water, splitting it up into hydrogen and oxi oxygen, building that into his plant material. I had never really thought about that before. It's kind of miraculous. Yeah. 
um, those, all those other nutrients, the ones we think about, why are they so important if they only make up like five to 10% of the plant? Well, those are the nutrients that plants uh, need to get out of the soil. Nitrogen is sort of kind of in between there because legumes, with the help of the bacteria, the rhizobium bacteria and their nodules, they can snatch that out of the air, cycle it through their roots and then through, you know, into the plant. But all those other things come from soil. All those bits that come from the soil, though, they're like the nuts and bolts of the engine that hold it all together. By, by weight, you know, the nuts and bolts are a pretty small part of your engine, but uh, without them, you don't have an engine, right? right? You need all those little parts to hold all that carbon and oxygen and hydrogen together. So that's why those are so important. You can grow a plant, sort of, in a sterile growing medium, uh, it won't look very good, but um, whereas if you provide it with nutrients, it will actually grow in a healthy way. Now, different plants will have different amounts of these nutrients uh, within a bit of a, a small range. Like that carbon number doesn't change a whole lot. We talk about carbon rich things and carbon poor things. Really, the carbon is somewhere around that 40 45% in most plants. Nitrogen will go up a little higher, like a legume might be up around 3%, um, but not too much <coughs> higher than that, you might get 4, and you go down to 1. So uh, really those numbers, like they, they shift a little, but we're not talking about some plants that have like 40% nitrogen or anything like that. But anyway, that's a bit about what plants are made of. So then, going back to managing soil fertility. In organic farming, I think sometimes it, we find it's a little bit hard to find a, an appropriate balance between two extremes. On the one extreme, especially if we're coming from a conventional farming background, is that we want to provide everything to those plants. We don't want to, you know, here, here you go, eat it up, spoon feed them, you know, make them grow really well. Uh, on the other extreme, some uh, organic farmers have a tendency to want to just let nature run its course, uh, let the plants fend for themselves, the soil biology will take care of everything and we'll all be okay and they provide nothing. Uh, I'm suggesting that maybe we need to do something that's sort of in the middle, which I'm calling tough love for plants, which is where you create the conditions that will allow them to succeed. You, um, so that includes a quite healthy soil biology and that kind of stuff. Um, some adequate nutrients that are around. You give them some resources and you use some good management, but they still have to do the work of getting the nutrients out of the soil. They actually have to send roots down and explore. Not everything is right there at their fingertips, okay? I don't know if that's a helpful analogy, but it was kind of helpful for me just thinking about it. So what does that actually mean when we're talking about farming? Let's think about the nitrogen cycle for a minute as sort of an example. So you probably, especially if you're at the back, you can't read any of this and that's okay because the point is that there's a lot of things on here. There's lots of little arrows going here and there and whatever and lots of processes. And um, the part of it that really matters at its most basic level to us is where um, is this the point or two? Oh, it is. Um, is where this crop grows and the crop gets some nutrients out of the soil. So the all these other processes feed into that and eventually determine how much comes out of the soil and into the plant. Um, there's some losses that happen along the way. There's some stuff that just gets added, like from electrical storms, there's nitrogen added, and for the other nutrients like phosphorus, potassium stuff, there's always some more dissolving from the rock in the soil. There's always a little bit's added, a little bit's lost, um, all this stuff going on. So um, it's more or less not too different from a natural ecosystem. Um, all these same things happen, just you know, maybe on different time scales and whatever. The thing that we've really changed in agriculture, though, is that we do have some of these emissions that we wouldn't have otherwise. 
and of course we're always working to reduce our fossil fuel emissions and our fuel use and uh, exhaust gases and blah blah blah. Uh, the other thing is that we've got some nutrients leaving the system. We have grain products leaving, we have animal products leaving. And that is something that you wouldn't have in a natural ecosystem very much. You might have a little bit now and then, but not at the scale that we have in agricultural systems. So how can we manage um, all these processes um, to support optimum nutrient uh, balances in the soil? Oops. Well, we can start by trying to follow that sort of natural ecosystem model as much as we can. And that means keeping losses as low as possible and recycling nutrients as much as possible. And this is where livestock are really handy on our organic farm because they actually excrete most of the nutrients they eat. Most of it goes back on the land and you sell the animal and you've only exported about like 15% of the nutrients that they ate. Um, I should point out though that livestock are only recycling nutrients. They're not actually adding nutrients unless you feed them you bring in food feed from somewhere else, or you feed them on your neighbor's land in the day and then like, take them back home at night and let them you know, get killed at night, or whatever. Um, and you can do that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, you should maybe talk to your neighbor first. Uh, the point is that um, recycling nutrients within the farm as much as possible is really good and it's a very good uh, goal to strive for. Even so, you have some nutrients that are leaving in products. So, is nutrient export a bad thing? Though? Well, yes and no. I'm going to start on the no side. First of all, we want to grow productive crops, right? We need that to support our farm income. We also need productive <coughs> crops to actually support that soil biology. And there's research that shows that if you're not growing good crops, you're actually not supporting the, the critters in the soil very well. But when you have a high yielding crop, you are inevitably exporting some nutrients. You can see that sort of in between the yes and the no side, and I'm moving over to the yes, it is bad thing side, because if you keep doing that, you keep exporting and exporting and exporting, it gets back to that investment portfolio, right? If you are only taking stuff out of there all the time, uh, you know, depleting your capital, eventually the fund runs out. Unless, of course, you replace those funds and you add stuff back in. So let's talk a bit about nutrient replacement. First of all, how on earth do you do this on an organic farm? Well, nitrogen is actually the easy one. Legumes are our friends and they can, they, like I said before, they take the nitrogen out of the air when they're inoculated with the right bacteria. They um, incorporate it into the plant. When that plant decomposes, that nitrogen feeds other plants in their rotation. So those light and green manures that you heard these guys talking about before are super important. Alfalfa, hay crops, any kind of legume, perennial, uh, perennial legume forage crop, super important. Although remember that yes, the alfalfa or whatever is adding in, but when you harvest that hay, you're exporting a bunch of it, plus exporting the P and the K and the S and everything that's in there. Um, but we'll leave that for the moment. Yeah, so nitrogen is really a pretty easy one in, the, uh, in terms of nutrient replacement. Phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, micronutrients, all those things are a little more complicated. <coughs> Um, you can see there's a very small picture of a compost turner there. I should have gotten one from these guys because this one's kind of pathetic. Uh, you see that uh, beef cow who is bale grazing and uh, if that bale came from the field just on that farm, um, right on the farm there, remember you're not actually adding nutrients, you're recycling them. But if you bought that bale from somewhere else, then you are adding nutrients to your farm. Uh, depleting nutrients from the other guy's farm, so remember that, but, um, but some people have excess nutrients and want to get rid of some. Um, and then there are also products that you can use um, of all sorts of different types, and I'm not going to go into that. I'm actually not going to go into the details of any of these, because I think the farmers on the panel later will probably talk about them. Um, 
The more interesting question, though, or the, maybe the more difficult one sometimes is, OK, I know how to do this. When should I do this? And how do I know when? Uh, Nitrogen, again, is a fairly easy one. Uh, we can, it's pretty easy to diagnose a nitrogen deficiency in a crop because we can see that it just looks yellow, it's not growing well, all those kinds of things. Uh, so we've seen that depleting or that replacing nitrogen uh, is needed usually about every two to three years. And depending on how much you're adding at a time, how productive that greener and how alfalfa was, but uh, it seems like the, the about three years or so is about the max that can really work. Phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, well, that depends. There depends a lot on what your soil is like in the first place, depends a lot on what the biological activity is there. Um, there's a lot of different factors there. And uh, in some soils, you, you personally might never have to uh, replace potassium on your farm. A lot of prairie soils are really rich in potassium. Your children might have to, um, but you know that bank account can be pretty large in some cases. Other cases, it's pretty small, and you have to start thinking about building that up a little sooner. All right. Well, if we don't exactly know when, maybe we can do a little bit of sleuthing and look for some clues that tell us when we should be thinking about replacing those uh, those nutrients. Um, We'll, we'll use the nitrogen cycle again as just as an example, uh, although the process probably applies a little more to some of the other nutrients, but uh, just to show different parts of the nutrient cycle that we can look at to give us some clues. Um, conventional farmers and many organic farmers too, the first place we would look to for clues is soil tests. So soil tests, a conventional, a regular soil test that you get from ag guys or whatever, the nitrogen part of that will basically tell you this little bit of the nitrogen cycle. How much nitrate is in your soil. Okay? That leaves out a lot of other things. So you can do some other tests and you know you can actually test for ammonia in the soil. You can even get fancy and test how much is going to come out of the um, soil organic matter and you can use stuff like plant <coughs> simulators to actually measure how much is coming out. Even so, it's not a very big piece of the whole cycle, is it? Um, so what else can we look at? Plant tests. This is, as uh, Martin S. liked to say, what better plant root simulator than a plant root? Uh, if we actually test the plant material and see how many, what amount of nutrients the plant was able to get out of the soil, it's a pretty good indication of how those nutrients were becoming available and, and how well the plant was snatching those up. So we can test the plant material for the nutrient content and nutrient uptake. And we can also test legumes and, uh, uh, for their nutrient content, see how well they're fixing as sort of an estimate of how much nitrogen is being added back in by nitrogen fixation. Still well, covers some more of the picture there, but still not, a, not nearly the whole thing. Another thing we can look at is doing nutrient budgets. And this gets back to that export thing. We can look at how much of the nutrients we're actually sending off the farm in crop products and in livestock products. And maybe if we're bringing stuff in, bringing in some compost or whatever, how much we're actually bringing in. And just like a profit and loss statement for um, a business or a farm, you can then see, like, oh, I had a big deficit of whatever this year. I should think about. Um, you know, balancing that off, uh, bringing some more of whatever nutrient in, or oh, I had a surplus of that, and uh, maybe that means I wasn't exporting enough because my yields were low. There's some clues like that that we can get about the nutrient cycling. The most important one that I say, though, when you're looking for these clues is yes, do some tests, but field observations, you walking in your fields, is the best way of uh, finding those clues looking at basically if a plant is growing healthily, probably the soil is healthy too. And does it mean that it'll stay healthy forever? No, and that's why you're out walking all the time, right? Checking, seeing how moisture conditions change, seeing how the roots are developing, seeing how, um, you know, the, how the plant is developing all through the season. 
<laughs> okay, so with all that information, we can get a more complete picture of what is actually happening in the soil and a little bit about why things are happening in the soil too. And this brings us to um, a bit of a broader look at soil fertility. Um, as we saw, soil provides the, the resources for nutrient cycling, all those different molecules like nitrogen and phosphorus, sulfur, all those things, which we can call the resources in the process. Um, but it also provides the place, the venue, for all these processes to happen. And that has to do with physical properties. So when you look, when you go out in the field and you see, oh, stuff's really growing poorly in this little spot. And you, know, you can take like a, a wire flag or something, you poke down and you say, oh, I've got a hard pan at six inches or whatever, you know, maybe that's, or you dig up the roots and you see they're all like going sideways. Uh, you know, there's some clues that you can gain from looking at your physical soil um, and figuring out why the, or how that's affecting the ability of the plant to actually get the, the nutrients it needs. Um, and then, of course, uh, the soil is also providing the agents for all these processes, which are all those critters in the soil we were talking about. And that has to do with the soil biological properties. And, uh, you know, there's tests for those things. You can measure microbial biomass and this and that, whatever. You can also just go out in your field and dig up a handful of soil and smell it. And you know that earthy smell? That's microbes working. Um, so there, you know, you can use all your senses to, to get an idea of how the soil is working and um, how, what, what parts might be kind of, what parts of the process might be sort of breaking down or kind of tying up bottle, the bottlenecks in that nutrient cycling process. And when we think about all those parts, that, that's where we're really talking about soil health. Talking about the, the nutrients, the, the chemical properties of the soil, the physical properties, and uh, the biological properties of the soil. Okay. Well, I'm pretty much done, so that's good timing. Just summing up, uh, just to remind you of a few key points to remember. We, our goals as farmers, and especially as organic farmers, are to build soil organic matter. That's your investment portfolio to protect you against risk, to make your farm resilient and healthy. Uh, we also want to give those crops some tough love, right? Create good conditions for them and uh, help them along a little bit, uh, but make them do a lot of the work uh, of finding nutrients around. But then, when we see them struggling, we can intervene a little bit and you know, maybe add in that whatever nutrient is limiting them. Oops, we want to recycle nutrients as much as possible, both within the farm and beyond the farm borders. So when we talked about how useful what livestock are for uh, recycling nutrients, that doesn't mean that every farmer has to have livestock. You can cooperate with a neighbor and uh, you know, bring manure back over, even bring his animals over, graze a, a green manure crop, graze your alfalfa hay instead of cutting hay that year, whatever. Um, bring in compost. There's lots of ways to get the benefits of livestock and their nutrient recycling properties onto your farm, even without you owning any livestock. Same as if you're a livestock farmer, find a grain person to partner up with and to benefit each other. Um, be aware of nutrient exports. That doesn't mean you have to be replacing nutrients this second, but you need to know, realize that they're leaving, and have a plan in mind for bringing them back at some point. Uh, or maybe just for your children or grandchildren to bring them back, but you have to be aware that that, that is happening. Um, yeah, making a plan for replacing nutrients, especially nitrogen. That one is not to, to be left for your kids. That one is every few years. That's um, an active management um, thing that, you know, that every organic farmer needs to do all the time. And then go out and look for clues about soil fertility and soil health all the time, observing those plants, seeing how they're growing, observing the soil, seeing what might be um, affecting how the plants are growing. And then go and put your plan into action and learn from each other and share your ideas and what has worked for you. And I think together we can 
um, keep growing, building our knowledge on how to make farms, um, organic farms, more sustainable and um, healthy for all of us. So the question is, is there a rule of thumb about how much nitrogen you can get out of the soil based on how much organic matter you have in your soil? And yes, sort of, I would say, and Gary Martins is the one who told me this, and I hope I have it right, and if not, Gary, please yell at me. Um, I think the idea is you can get about 10 pounds per acre of nitrogen for every 1% of organic matter that you have in your soil. Yes? Okay, thumbs up from Gary. So that means if you've got 4% uh, soil organic matter, that's total soil organic matter, uh, you could expect to get about 40 pounds per acre. But I'm just going to add a little but yeah, there. Yeah. And I'll just say that the, the, the nitrogen in soil organic matter, here comes my financial analogy again, it's a bit like RRSPs in that it only doles out so much at a time. So if you just kept relying on that every year, uh, I think the amount, the amount of nitrogen you get out would decline more quickly than your organic matter percent would. Your, the percent organic matter will be declining, but it's, it takes a while for that to change. Whereas your nitrogen that you're getting out of it um, will drop off more quickly. And what about phosphorus? And what about is, phosphorus? Is, is there a rule of thumb as well for it? I, ha I don't know of any rule of thumb for phosphorus. Does anyone know of a rule of thumb for how much phosphorus you can get out of your soil? It depends on your fungal concentrations because they're the ones that release organic acids that unlock the phosphates that are built into the humic particles. So microbial biomass is directly related to how much nutrients you'll be able to get out of your organic matter in your soil. Okay, did everyone hear that? More so than nitrogen. More so than nitrogen. Yeah, so he's saying that it depends a lot on the fungal um, community in the soil, the amount of fungus in your soil, yeah. because they're the ones that produce those substances that release the phosphorus um, from its mineral forms. So I don't know if that's a rule of thumb, but mm. a bit of an idea. Any other questions? No. I must have been very clear. You were answer. very clear. I will yes. be around for the rest of the day, so feel oh, free to Oh, there's a question. Oh, wait. <laughs> in, in your research, are you guys using conventional soil tests, or have you used, you know, like water soluble instead of conventional? We, the question was whether we're using conventional soil tests or whether we're using some of the alternative um, soil tests, like the water soluble nutrients and that kind of thing. We have been using conventional soil tests supplemented with plant tests and, and field observations. Um, I think a lot of those newer tests may be very useful, but there's, they haven't been done often enough in our soils maybe to, like, yes, you get a number out of it, but what does that number even mean? Like, what do I compare that to? And, and they're not necessarily that well calibrated for our soils yet, whereas the standard tests, um, yes, they only measure certain things, but they're pretty reliable at measuring those things. So we use those with a combination of actually looking at the, the nutrient concentration in the plant and, um, and then visual observations. I think those, all those alternative soil tests will, I think they will probably um, become a lot more re reliable in the next little while as there's a lot more interest in them now. Bricks, bricks testing? Bricks testing. Have you used any of that? We have played around with that a little bit, and um, we have not done any formal testing with that. Um, we find it's not a very precise tool to use as a scientific tool um, because there's so many factors that affect the bricks content. So if the sun is behind a cloud when you're sampling in one plot and then an hour later by the time you get to the last plot in the trial the sun's been shining again for an hour it will really affect your bricks content so um, as a farmer especially if you're say testing forages you know where you actually uh, want where it might determine when in the day you're cutting your forage those kinds of things can be really important and test in the morning or throughout the, the day, I think, can be important. 
uh, or comparing between, say, two crops that are grown side by side where you know what the management has been. Uh, you know, you can, as sort of a, a rough, uh, a rough tool, I guess. Um, that's sort of my thought on, on bricks. And the other thing about bricks is I, I still haven't seen a surefire way to actually increase your bricks. I've seen lots of people talk about surefire ways. Okay, so the question is about uh, adding more diversity to green cover, cover crops. Um, to me, adding green manure is the primary, um, the primary uh, goal of a green manure is to fix nitrogen. So to me, I don't care how many species you have in your green manure, but I want most, at least half of that plant biomass to be a legume. It can be five different kinds of legumes, or it can be one. I think the, the end result will be sort of similar. Um, where the extra diversity helps, I think, is especially if you are, um, if you're grazing it, you know, a more diverse diet uh, never hurts the livestock. It also, a more diverse diet for the soil microbes is also good. And um, I don't know if they've been able to pinpoint and say, oh yeah, a crop grown after a, a green manure with 20 species yielded whatever percent more than one grown with only two species. But there's just sort of this general support for good soil function and all those good things. There's just more different kinds of roots, exploring different parts of the soil. There's that insurance kind of component to it where if it's a wet year, maybe your fava beans do well and the, poor, and the peas don't. If it's a dry year, maybe the peas do well in the mix and the fava beans don't. So there's some of those sort of, um, kind of those redundancies in the system that um, kind of just make sure that everything happens in the system. Um, but it's, I, I don't know if, um, yeah, there hasn't been a lot of hard evidence on actual you know, benefits or that kind of thing that I know of anyway. So the question is about the plant tissue testing, and uh, whether we're just it's a forage test or what. Yeah, we um, we just at the university we send our samples to AgVice to get analyzed, and sometimes we'll actually do uh, a forage test. Uh, they also offer, uh, and that will give you all of the like the digestible nutrients and the ADF and blah blah blah. Um, for our purposes, they also have a test, which is basically the same price, which um, is just called a complete nutrient analysis, where for our purposes uh, is, is just as useful because it just gives you the percent of each nutrient and doesn't do all those other calculations. But yeah, you can get that done at pretty much any lab. A forage test will tell you most of the main, the main nutrients. You might just have to convert protein the forage back into just pure nitrogen, which is just a simple math, just to divide it by 6.25, and um, convert protein into total nitrogen. But yeah, it's, it's easy to do, it costs like 30-ish dollars or so. Okay, to convert protein to nitrogen, you take the protein and divide it by 6.25, because protein is only partially nitrogen. So your nitrogen number should end up being smaller I was once told that you should never ever do mental math in front of a crowd. <laughs> Good advice. Yeah. Good advice. Thank you very much, Joanne. Thank you.